Thank you, Nick. <clears throat> um, as, as Nick indicated, excuse me, I'm going to change direction a little bit here and talk a little bit about Sawfish. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to acknowledge my co-authors, Colin Sipferdorfer, Shelley Norton, and Tanya Wiley. Um, but I do want to mention that there's a host of other players that I'll, I'll talk about in the end. <clears throat> so first, I'll talk off, and my pardon to anyone in the audience who already knows this, but I uh, just want to give you an idea what a sawfish is, because we've been talking about sharks. Uh, sawfish are actually more closely related to rays. Um, they're in their own family. <clears throat> There's uh, currently seven species worldwide, but uh, there is some potential species reclassification going on. Um, the species is largely found circumtropical. And the big thing about sawfish, um, besides it being a, a, a ray-like animal, is it's characterized by this large rostrum, which uh, you can see here in this center part here. And the rostrum is one of the, the major diagnostic characteristics that we use to differentiate species. <clears throat> now, if I could uh, take you back in time a little bit and uh, bring you to the, uh, the United States around the end of the 19th century, um, you'll notice that uh, the, the range of sawfish, and this is based on museum records, reports, things like that, um, range from uh, the coast of Texas in Mexico all the way up to the coast of uh, New York State. So it had a, had a very broad range. Um, the red down here on the bottom indicates the core range where 95% of the occurrences occurred. And obviously as you get out further from that, the frequency of occurrence is much lower. But the important thing to take home is, as you can see, it had a very large range around the turn of the century. I mean, so much so that, you know, you see reports from some early uh, scientific investigations such as this publication by Everman and Bean that from one survey they reported 300 records of sawfish from a small river lagoon off the east coast of Florida. And I always like this little quote from uh, Field and Stream magazine, which is an outdoor magazine about what sawfishes were like back in the day, you know, stalking bathers with their rostrum and piercing them through boats. I just kind of always found that as an interesting anecdote and kind of see some early depictions of sawfish that come from some of the old uh, uh, Spanish explorers. <clears throat> now, going forward in time, uh, now if you notice now the, the time period is 1964 through 2000, and you already notice that within the space of about 60 years, the range has really contracted down to the south part of the United States. The records are pretty much gone from anywhere north of Florida on the Atlantic Ocean, and with some reports still throughout the northern Gulf of Mexico. And then we go further in time to a much more recent period, and you'll notice that the population has now contracted pretty much to the Florida area. Um, one thing to note here is that that 95% core population down here in the south part of the U.S. Uh, is also a region of the Everglades National Park, which by coincidence was created about the same time that we started to see a large decline in sawfish. And many of my colleagues agree that if Everglades National Park was not created around that time, providing a refuge for the core population, we probably wouldn't be seeing very many sawfish, if any sawfish at all, to this day. <clears throat> so what happened? Where did all the sawfish go? A couple potential sources of what happened to the population are two sources. One being fishing mortality and the other being habitat loss. And it's not one or the other, you respect it. They both seem to have equal detriment on the population. And you know, concerning fishing mortality, it's not just strictly a recreational or commercial. The rostra is, is probably its own worst enemy because that rostra gets entangled in everything from gill nets to pot lines to long lines. Which, which makes it an impediment to the species. And then the habitat loss, which I'll talk about in a moment, some of the inshore areas and some of the coastal regions have had extreme degradation over the last hundred years. <laughs> so much so that in the United States, the, uh, the Ocean Conservancy requested listing uh, the North Atlantic population of sawfish under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the process of how we review animals to be listed on the ESA, but the take home message was is that in 2003, the National Marine Fisheries Service listed the U.S. population as endangered. Now, when it was listed endangered, we also kind of take a look and take a step back for a second. And if this is just not the U.S. population of sawfish, worldwide, the entire family is in trouble. I mean, so much so that all species are listed as critically endangered under the IUCN Red List. Um, this is an example from a study that's currently being conducted on uh, the large two sawfish. These are some more recent records, but if you go back historically, it had a broad range from northern Africa all the way down the coast. And, and in fact, so much so, uh, large-shoe sawfish were on a coin in Senegal. 
back in the 1920s and 30s. And there actually was a presentation given yesterday uh, about West African fisheries and some of the conclusions that some uh, West African states are, are indicating that sawfish are now extinct in those countries. So it's not just strictly the U.S. population. But getting back to the, the U.S. population, Chris's pectinata, when it was listed on the, on the U.S. Endangered Species, when it was listed on the ESA, excuse me, Endangered Species Act, um, we have to go through a process of recovering the animal. So we kind of sat around and said, okay, what data do we have available? And we didn't have much. I mean, it was pretty bad. Um, the life history information we actually had was from another species that was done in the 1970s. <laughs> Anecdotal reports about habitat, no real information about movement, and very little reported information about interactions with fisheries. So we kind of put our heads together, and Collins and Fedorfer, who used to be at Mont Merlin Laboratory, started putting together this survey data to try to get an idea of records of where sawfish currently are occurring. And the way we went about this is we just basically looked at public sighting records, taking advantage of the fact that sawfish are charismatic. When somebody catches one, it usually makes a newspaper. Right? Flyers were posted at sites throughout historic areas of the range. There was lots of outreach to fishing groups, lots of outreach in terms of websites to try to get all the anecdotal and actually factual information we could get about where sawfish were currently occurring. <clears throat> and this worked out very well. An encounter database was developed, and from 1998 to 2008, over 1,000 records were reported on sawfish. Information is still being collected to this day on, on encounters of small-tooth sawfish. And it wasn't like, you know, we just took everything for granted. We, there was a very rigorous criteria that was used for inclusion of, of encounter reports. I mean, there was quite a bit of, you know, missed Misreporting. I mean, one of the classic stories that I always like is Tanya Wiley, who was a co-author on the study, ran over to an area where a sawfish was reported dead on the beach because we had very really little information from dead animals. She gets over there, and what it is, it's a swordfish washed up on the beach. So there was a lot of miscommunication about what sawfish were reported and not. So the point being that it did go through a rigorous process of making sure that if a sawfish was reported, it was a sawfish. Now, this data was very useful for us in terms of gleaning habitat requirements that we needed to recover the species. You can see here some of the data that was gathered and analyzed. The take home message from this stuff is from all the encounters that were reported, the physical and biological features which had the strongest correlation with an encounter was sawfish were generally reported in water depths less than about a meter. There was very strong correlation with areas that had mangrove buffers or mangrove shorelines, and they generally were found in areas that, were, that had variable salinity in urohairline areas. So this was, a, this was a big step for us, because as I keep mentioning, we didn't know anything, you know, largely from anecdotal information. So now we have some quantitative data to go on. So now that we had some encounter information, we still didn't have an idea of abundance. You know, is the abundance increasing? Is it decreasing? Right. Luckily for us, there has been a, a voluntary survey going on since the 1970s in the core area of the population. In Everglades National Park, they had a program going where fishermen would come back that were in the park, and they were interviewed, and information was gathered such as species caught, how long were you out, how many people were in your party, you know, are you working with a guide? So we were able to take that information and using some generalized linear model techniques, developed an index of abundance, a relative index of abundance for these species. Now the interesting thing about this data, again, it's being reported back since 1972, sawfish were never reported until 1989, which is quite a distance. And as I said, it, we find it highly doubtful that if a fisherman didn't catch one, he wasn't going to report it. And this is even way before they even considered for listing in the ESA. I mean, in most cases back in the day, if they caught a sawfish, they lopped that rostrum off and it went as a trophy above their bar. I mean, that's one of the things, if you go to South Florida, the big thing to look for is bars with sawfish rostrum above them. So, but the big take-home message that we got from looking at this data is that from about 1989 is the abundance of sawfish appears to have stabilized, which is, a good, which is good news. It's no longer decreasing, especially in the core area of the population. If we found it was decreasing in the core, we might make, make some red, set, red flags that we want to go up and take a look at some other issues. Now, that was some of the baseline work that we did to start moving sawfish forward in terms of a recovery strategy. We have other future, what someone would call more quantitative scientific research that we're doing, which is tending to back up the information that was collected, for example, using the encounter database. For example, a recent study using acoustic telemetry 
which is much more quantitative and much more robust than, say, strictly encounter data. But what that data has shown is sawfish tend to pre prefer areas between about 18 and 24 parts per part PSUs, which goes along with that urihaline habitat requirements that we see from the encounter database. They also seem to be very tied to the mangroves. We have evidence from the telemetry that sawfish are moving in and out of the mangrove areas. Also, from some of the archival tag data we have, we've been putting satellite tags, we are finding that sawfish are actually moving a lot deeper than we originally thought. And what that sets up for is, are there any sawfish that are moving back and forth from adjacent areas in the Bahamas, or are they strictly staying in the South Florida area? And that's one of the major pushes we're also looking at in terms of population movements. We're also finding that juvenile growth is much faster than we originally thought, which will have implications for potential recovery strategies. So when we started putting this, this when Nick started putting this session together, we wanted to try to find initiatives or lessons learned that could be applied to, from what we learned from Prestes Teconata to the family as a whole, because as I previously mentioned, they're not in good shape worldwide. So what we found out about small tooth sawfish in the U.S., can we take that as sort of a baseline or a litmus test and use it for sawfish recoveries globally? And my, I'd say yes. But the first thing we need to do is get data. All right? We have similar issues. They're very, they're very charismatic species. We need to take advantage of that as we move forward globally. An encounter databases or a similar program set up globally or in certain countries would go very far in terms of determining the status of sawfish in those particular countries. And sawfish, you know, as it's been mentioned before, the U.S. and Kenya proposed sawfish for listing under CITES, and this was adopted. So we have recognized by the worldwide community that sawfish do need protection on a global basis. Habitat mapping of mangroves will also go a long way because recent publications indicate that sawfish are, like mangroves, and very poor. So we may be finding some correlation between the distribution of mangroves, two minutes, okay, and the distribution of sawfish. So these are some initial steps that we've learned studying pectinata that potentially could be applied to sawfish on more of a global data, on a more global basis, excuse me. Before I, before I end on this talk, I just want to talk about are the initiatives actually working in the U.S.? Trying to end on a positive note. And one thing that we have noticed by looking at the most recent data up through 2010 is you notice that red core area is starting to creep up a little bit on the west coast of Florida, which would tend to indicate that we're not out of the woods yet by no means, but it does show something positive, that some things seem to be working. <clears throat> so on that, I just want to acknowledge all the sawfish, small tooth sawfish recovery members and all the associates that have helped out in various ways from the beginning of this program. Uh, Nick Dolby and Lucy Harrison for organizing the symposium and for Save Our Seas for providing funding, and I'd be happy to try to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you.